In the last two years, the MPC Great Books program is proud to have been recognized with three grants from the APGAR Foundation. The APGAR Foundation, according to their own mission statement, makes grants to undergraduate programs that increase knowledge of and exposure to aspects of Western and American culture that have been instrumental in creating and sustaining the United States and other liberal democracies. The Foundation wants college faculty and students to deepen their understanding and appreciation of Western and American traditions, institutions, and values. As an APCAR grant recipient, MPC joins such institutions as Washington and Lee University, Villanova, Penn State, UCLA, Emory, MIT, and the University of Virginia. MPC's APGAR Foundation grants have been used to convene two colloquiums, Great Books and Democracy, with Robert Pinsky, Dana Joya, and Victor Davis Hanson, followed by Imaginative Freedom and Political Freedom with Mark uh, Claire Cavanaugh, Zachary Mason, and Mark Bauerlein. DVDs of all those presentations are available in the MPC library. The MPC Great Books program has been deeply honored by the APGAR Foundation's continuing confidence and support. And we're delighted to announce that last week the APGAR Foundation awarded our program a new grant. Right. This semester, the Great Books program is hosting its first visiting scholar, University of Virginia professor of romantic poetry and author Mark Edmondson, who will lecture and conduct seminars on love, rock and roll, and football. <laughs> An interesting trio. We will also visit, uh, he will also visit the Great Books Club and the Creative Writing Club. Professor Edmondson's wife, author and professor Elizabeth Denton, graciously offered to teach a workshop on the short story, which she is doing now right down in the next building. And now, Mark Edmondson asks the question, can rock and roll save your life? Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you for coming, and thanks, David, for uh, inviting me. This is my second time here. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for the weather. Very wonderful. Um, so these are three talks, and they seem entirely unrelated. Um, can music uh, save your life? Can rock and roll save your life? And then, um, why does love have to be so sad? That's tomorrow night. And then, uh, finally, um, the, faith in, the faith of football. Um, and uh, uh, so you might ask, what do these three things have in common other than the by one person. And um, the thing is this, um, they kind of take off from a remark that my old mentor, Harold Bloom, made, where he says, just kind of off the cuff, he says, in our current world, our erotic lives have become our spiritual lives. Our erotic lives have become our spiritual lives. That is, where religion was, there the erotic life of the individual now is. That's the source of meaning and intensity and passion and drama and all the things that one used to associate with the salvation of the soul. I thought, yeah, that's kind of right. That's kind of right. So let's explore that. That's what I'll be up to tomorrow night. Um, but it also occurred to me that, that for many of us, our musical lives are our spiritual lives. And I want to explore that. That's what we're doing today. And uh, for others of us, our sports lives even as spectators, are, are, have become our spiritual lives. So that will be the exploration on, um, on Thursday. Um, what I'm going to say here, I take to be a little bit on the controversial side, um, and I uh, would uh, uh, entirely expect and invite uh, being controverted, if that's a, uh, if that's a word. Um, I guess the moral of this story is uh, um, music, listen less, play more, or something like that. Anyway, let's see, and, and, and I'll read to you, uh, it's for a section of the piece, uh, 20, 25 minutes, and then let's talk a little bit, and I really do want to hear what you think about this. Of all the pieces that I'm going to do, this uh, is probably the most work in progress like, and the one tomorrow night, the most uh, uh, aspires to be the most uh, polished. So here we go. Who hasn't at least once had the feeling of being remade through music? Who is there who doesn't date a new phase in life to hearing this symphony or that song? I heard it, we say, and everything changed. I heard it, and the gates sprang open, and I walked through. When I first heard Dylan's Like a Rolling Stone in 1965, not long after it came out, I was amazed. At the time, I liked to listen to the radio. I liked pop. The Beatles were fine. The Stones were better. But nothing I'd heard until then prepared me for Dylan's song. The record had all the fluent joy of a pop number, but something else was going on, too. This song was about lyrics, language. 
Dylan wasn't chanting some truism about being in love or wanting to get free or wasted for the weekend. He had something to say. He was exasperated. He was pissed off. He'd clearly been betrayed by somebody or by a whole nest of somebody's, and he was letting them have it. His words were exuberantly weird and sometimes almost embarrassingly inventive. And often I couldn't have told you what they meant. You used to ride on a chrome horse with your diplomat who carried on his shoulder a Siamese cat? Chrome horse? Diplomat? What was going on? I sensed Dylan's disdain, sensed his near fury, but the song suggested way more than it declared. This was a sidewinder of a song, intense and angry, but indirect and riddling, too. I tried to hear every line. Dylan's voice seemed garbled, and our phonograph player wasn't new. I can still see myself with my head cocked to the spindle, eyes clenched, trying to shut out the room around me as I strained to grab the words from the harsh, melodious wind of the song. Wasn't it hard when you discovered that? He really wasn't where it's at. You're invisible now. You've got no secrets to conceal. I couldn't listen to that song enough. I'd liked music before that. I'd liked stuff I'd heard on the radio. I even liked the Beethoven and the Mahler that my father played at top volume on Sunday afternoons, though I never would have admitted as much to him. But the Dylan was different. Other music made me temporarily happy, or tranquil, or full of energy. But this music made me curious and puzzled. There was something in the grooves that I wasn't getting. There was something in the mix of the easy, available pop hook and the grading voice and the elliptic words that signaled in the direction of a kinds of experience I hadn't had yet. And maybe I never would. The song made me feel that life was larger than I had thought and maybe, maybe want to find out what it was that I was missing. I guess the song made me feel hopeful that my house and my neighborhood and friends and family didn't compose the limits of the world. Before, I may have been worried that if somehow I sailed beyond them, maybe I'd fall off the edge into some empty no-zone. The song kicked open a door in my mind, to borrow a phrase Bruce Springsteen used to describe his own experience with it. But to be honest, in the time, the door may have gotten a little rusty from disuse. Because really, after I heard like a Rolling Stone on the radio and bought the single and listened to it 50 or so times, I put it away. I never went out to cop a Dylan album. I never thought much about the guy for the next five years. I went back to what you might call music as usual. I went back to using music to tune my moods. It was as though I was myself an instrument, and I was playing away, but in a perpetual state of disharmony. I was out of whack with myself. I was out of tune. At 16, who isn't? I was simply a human being and a young one who lived in a mash of discordant feelings and thoughts. I wanted things. I wanted a lot of things, but I wasn't always sure what they were. I wanted a girlfriend, but when I thought about it, I didn't much want any of the girls I'd offer at school, nor they me. I wanted to be an athlete, but games often bored me half stiff, and the school jocks were sometimes impossible to take. I wanted to be right with God, but when the time came to go to confession, I often had so many sins on the docket that I despaired of getting them in line and up before the judgment seat. So, I had a lot of static inside. My inner life resembled my radio, an age number the size of a toaster, crimson and badly chipped, gave off when I was traveling from one of my pop stations to another, swirling the dial. It gave off the sound of chaos and the feel of the void. But soon, I arrived safely on the shores of WMEX, and there was Arnie Woo Woo Ginsburg up until all hours, ready to maitre d' me into the sound of the Beach Boys, the Beatles, Jan and Dean, the Stones. Then all of my jarring and jangling emotions went into the radio and came back out making melodious sense. If you're a sitter on the floor, there's some sitter on the floor space here. If not, not. I love it when people sit on the floor. It makes me feel like it's 1968 again. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Then all my jarring and jangling emotions went into the radio and came back out making melodious sense. It was a little like what happened when my mother washed my clothes. She'd trudge down to the basement with a yellow plastic basket full of raunchy jeans and t-shirts, and if it was fall, two or three football jerseys and pants smudged black with cinders and smeared with green grass stains. An hour or two magics from Sears and Roebuck, and there came my laundry back in pleasant white piles. The football stuff I remember in particular. It appeared in a mound that looked like a fluffy loaf of just cooked bread. Were some of the songs I listened to sad? Of course they were. 
that sadness lies latent in the soul. We are always, in some measure, sad. And the sadness that I heard when I listened to a Leonard Cohen song or the Beatles' Norwegian Wood was a different in kind from the sadness that it habitually... In, pardon me. The sadness that I heard when I listened to a Leonard Cohen song or the Beatles' Norwegian Wood was different in kind from the sadness that habitually inhabited my spirit. The musical sadness was a melodious sadness. It had a shape. It made sense. It flowed along almost predictable lines. I won't say that musical sadness exercised the sorrows latent in me, but the music gave the sadness a benign expression. It put my sadness in an attractive box. It let me experience sadness from a distance. I experienced my grief over my younger sister's death, which had taken place a few years before. But I contemplated that grief at the same time. It's difficult to express. Music makes life melodious, assuming that the music does have a melody. Music makes life melodious, but life is not always so. Pop music, available music, suggests by its easy, pleasurable repetitions that life makes ready and easy sense. There's a harmony in our lives, in our beings, or at least we can pretend that this is so for the duration of the song. The music of Beethoven or of Coltrane is also patterned, but the patterns are far more difficult to find. You have to listen hard. You have to have an educated ear. You feel that you're almost collaborating with the composer when you seek out the subtle echoes and indirect recapitulations. Life makes some sense to Beethoven and Coltrane, but it is a difficult, remote sense that is not available to all and that can wink out in an instant. In Beethoven's late quartets, the coherence could be unbearably difficult to find, though I think the patterns are always there. Is this music all about theme and variations? I once asked my father, hoping to grab his attention in the midst of something by Brahms. All music is theme and variation, he said. But how, atten but how attenuated that variation can be. How we can listen to a piece of music pining for a phrase that will connect us to something we have heard before and begin to reveal an overall structure. In Coltrane's late work, I sometimes can find no consistency of theme, no unity of sound, try as I might. I wonder if the impulse there isn't to turn against all sense-making through music and declare life to be incommensurable with any kind of cogency. A tale told by an idiot, as the poet says, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Music gives harmony to feeling. Music suggests a sense to life or in the rare cases, refuses that kind of sense-making. And I wonder, late Beethoven makes me wonder, late Coltrane makes me wonder, do we go to music to hide from our fears that the world makes no sense at all? Do we seek in the harmonies of music a way to stabilize an inner life that is incoherent and strange? Do we tame ourselves through music? Do we use music to hypnotize ourselves? Do we apply music like a medicine to calm and quell that in ourselves we cannot understand but perhaps should? Music as a bomb upon the waters. Music as the settling of the storm. Music as a way to soothe ourselves into a certain kind of torpor, a certain kind of acquiescent waking sleep. Stevens speaks of a child asleep in its own life. Can music save your life? Does music sometimes kick a door open inside the mind? I think that it does. Does it also sometimes insulate the house, fortify it, secure it from all wayward feelings and thoughts? I suspect that music does that too. And when a song does seem to kick a door open, we frequently listen to it over and over again until it's lost all of its power and all of its passion is spent. The philosopher Alan Bloom didn't much care for the effect that music had on his students. He believed that they used music to counterfeit experience. In particular, they used music to fabricate joy. He said that music, and rock music in particular, reproduced in the listener the feeling of triumph that came from completing a great work of art, or doing a heroic deed, or making a conceptual breakthrough in science or philosophy, or even finding the true love of one's life. Students, Bloom said, found in rock music a way to fabricate these emotions, and then they often took the next logical step. Why bother going further, they asked themselves. Why should one actually do the deed and put in all the work leading up when one can have the reward simply by sliding a record on or showing up at a concert. Bloom compared the more or less Dionysian experience of rock music to the experience of drugs. He seems to have had the hallucinogens in mind. 
after a heavy hitter's dose of LSD, in which the world becomes a wondrous kaleidoscope of sound and sight and even thought, what can everyday experience possibly offer? It manifests itself as a gray world of sameness and routine, nothing like the wonderland one has recently left. People who have had a fling with LSD often trudge through a wearisome life that never quite gets up to their expectations. Just so. Perhaps music lovers are only alive when they are plugged into their tombs. The rest of the time they have only themselves, and they are in themselves, all too insufficient. Bloom is a student of Plato, of course, and his critique of his students' music echoes Plato, and also the views of the later Nietzsche. Plato thought that music had a critical educative function. To Plato, the soul is by its nature divided. There's the rational part, the spirit, and the appetite. What's wanted is to bring these parts of the spirit into harmony with each other, reason ascendant, of course. And music can do a great deal to stimulate harmony. Melodious music helps to create a melodious soul. There's need for martial music for Plato. Warriors must be inspired. But what there is no need for is music that sends the soul into ecstasy. Music that lets appetite usurp reason and so makes a man or woman into a beast. Nietzsche was a great lover of ecstatic music, at least when he was young. His drug of choice was Wagner, on whom he eventually wrote, at least partially, four books. Wagner gave him the Dionysian thrill. It took him above the sobrieties of his classical education, his churchly background, and his tamped-down temperament. Good enough. But did not Wagner visit the same music on the crowd? Pardon me, did, Ma did Wagner visit the same magic on the crowd? Nietzsche maybe needed to be a bit less civilized than he was. But did the already wallowing common man need to unbind himself further from civilized restraint? In time, Nietzsche thought not. By the end of his life, he was drawn to light opera, Puccini, music of no overwhelming consequence at all. Now here comes the part that I expect will inspire a little bit of resistance. My students, like Alan Bloom's, live inside music. Their musical lives may well be their spiritual lives. It is hard to say. It's hard to say because they don't talk about music very eagerly. In class, I can get a conversation going about God with no problem. They love talking about alcohol and its effects on the human mind and spirit, theirs in particular. A conversation about sex is easy to start and quickly goes way further than I'd imagine and sometimes further than I want. But try asking about music. But the importance of music in the students' lives is quickly confirmed. They listen to it for hours a day. The abstemious ones put in at least two hours. The real revelers get to six, and eight, and ten. They trot around the university grounds with headphones on their heads. They plug into their tunes when they sit at their computers. Music, usually rap, is the iron hard heart of their parties. There is surely a competition, at least among English major types, about who listens to the most recondite bands. Sometimes they name them in discussion. The fruit bats, the shins, now no longer obscure, the homo sapien erectiles. I sometimes make up a few myself and throw them in the mix. <laughs> But when I ask what role music plays in their lives, or why they listen to what they do, there is generally silence. When I tell them what Plato had to say about music, and that it disapproved of almost all they listened to, for being far too raucous, far too stirring, far too close to anarchy, they bristle a bit and tell me that Plato is wrong. I ask them if listening to hardcore rap might influence their attitudes to sex and money, major themes in rap, of course. They tell me that I'm being silly, which to me is a little like saying that the food you eat has nothing to do with how your body feels and how it functions. But I speculate, based on what I see, and my speculation is this. Music brings drama to life for them. It makes them feel more vital, vigorous, intense. Because, I'm told by my students all this, this all the time, much of real life is, mildly, is a mildly toxic combination of boring and stressful. Music turns boredom into drama. Music turns anxiety, also known as stress, into equanimity. Melody works that way. The drama of music has that effect. Listening to little-known but cool bands puts them in a club in which they can feel special and singular. It is now cool to be a high-test fan of an up-and-coming band. You look down on others who join the jam too late. My students need the melody and the preciousness that music brings. For life now is hard. It is hard for my students as it was for me when I was, give or take their age. They are heaped with expectations. They are pressured to perform. Many of them are majoring in subjects that do not interest them at all. They are in their courses of study to succeed. They are there to do well. Very few of the young econ majors that I know came to the field with a burning desire to get to know Keynes and Smith better. <laughs> they came believing that economics would ensure success, or at least a job. 
they grind away, grind away in the guts of the dismal science, which is not even a science, though it is dismal enough. <laughs> their prospects are shaky. They're worried about what is to come. Does music save their lives? No, it preserves them, much as it did mine. But if saving your life means saving it from dullness and muted icy boredom, then music in this case is that which allows you to tolerate these things. Music as an unwind, music as a bomb, a cortisone spread. How can I say that? How can I say this? I say it because of the disparity between the wildness and freedom of the music and the lives my students seem to live and seem to want to live. This, I dare to say, is the generation of no generation gap. This is the generation that is busy cloning their parents. They need their music as a world elsewhere, just as I needed mine. Can music still kill a open a door in your mind? Of course it can. I'm nearly sure of it. No doubt everyday numberless young people, and a few older ones too, have the kind of experience that I did with Like a Rolling Stone. But it's worth asking what kind of door that song kicked open. What room exactly did I enter? Looking back, I guess the song helped me get excited about the possibilities in words. For what made the song different wasn't its melody. It was wonderful, sure. The organ intro still makes me grin with happy expectation. Something grand is coming soon. But I'd met other tunes just as gracefully intense. It was the lyrics that got me. I'd read other poetry then, though not much of it. My father loved the rhyme of the ancient mariner and could always be prevailed on to recite a stanza. He sometimes did so when not prevailed upon. But I thought poetry was by definition old stuff. Moving in its way, but always out of date. A little like those Beethoven and Mahler symphonies. But in Dylan I saw that music and lyrics could sound like now. There's a current stamp to what he was saying. Someone who listened to like a Rolling Stone 50 times wouldn't be entirely lost reading The Wasteland, or even notes toward a supreme fiction. If you had met a Napoleon in rags, you might with a little more effort be able to reach terms with the canon aspirin, or even Nanzio Nunzio, who provokes Ozymandias to tell him that the spouse, the bride, is never naked. Whatever the heck that may mean. The door that Dylan kicked open was into the world of words, and eventually, after five or eight years fluttering at the threshold, I made my way inside. In time, I began trying to write as well as to read, and I owe that trying to Dylan as much as to anybody else. If I'd had a little more musical inclination, I think the song would have made me want to make some songs of my own. I'd have wanted to bring across my own view of things in musical language that's strange and funny and perfectly phrased as Dylan. I might even say that the best thing that hearing music can do for you is to make you want to make your own. Sometimes I find it close to absurd that some people are musicians and singers and that others are silent apostles who never really let out a peep, maybe not even in the shower. Music seems to me like a basic human right, much like the right to prayer and the right to fall in love. Everyone's got a right to sing his song, though not everyone is to be compelled to listen to it. The notion that people have to do our singing for us is in some ways a precipitate of capitalism and the division of labor, which though it surely has its virtues, we have taken to an absurd degree. It's rather amazing to go to a concert and see 10,000 people in their seats, paying a healthy price to watch 10 people on stage, having fun. I read recently that every Comanche warrior had his personal song, written for him by the wise man in his tribe, and modified by the singer as the mood arose. The warrior woke up singing it, sang it from time to time during the day, and hummed it when he was going to sleep at night. The song might go on about what a great hunter he was, how many buffalo he'd shot, what an amazing lover he could be, how tall and handsome. It was righteous music. Can music save your life? I think that if music kicks in any door regularly, it's the door that separates us from making music of our own. Sing, hum, strum, toot. It's said that when the Diggers, a group of early hippies, were invited to a Saturday night Grateful Dead show and told they could come in for free, they disrespectfully declined. Saturday night was the night when they toked up, got out their guitars and bandos and harmonicas, and for some of the less gifted or lessened, the pots and the pans and the clicking spoons, and made their own noise. They had fun. I sometimes think that the ultimate liberation that someone else's music can provide is the liberation of you, the individual, into your own music. Music can be a pleasure to listen to, but spending your life as a consumer and not a creator is a chump's bet. Nietzsche said that eventually he judged music by one standard. How fertile did it make him? How much very musical philosophy did it help inspire him to write? Many of us have been duped by the consumer ideology. Consumerism says that life's greatest pleasures are in consuming, in buying good shit and enjoying it. But that's wrong. Life's pleasures are in creating things, even if the creations have a few cracks in them. If music doesn't produce music or something fresh, it's often a sterile diversion. There's no one whose company I shun more, this is going to make somebody really furious, I shun more than that of the music geek. It's a character, Fantasia. 
wears a catalog like knowledge, tastes like a guillotine, and sits at stiff attention when the tunes play. He is sterility itself. Take every aspect of his relation to music, reverse it, and good things will come. Music at its best moves people. That's what people say. And there's a truth there. It should move you from one place to another. It should move you to get off your enjoyment-oriented posterior and do something. The music geek only listens to the best music. He does it all day long, sitting in his Herman Miller Aeron chair with his Bose headphones on. He wears pads on his eyes. His face is drawn in sublime concentration. But to me, he's like somebody who eats only the best food, very picky in all his selections, but then never uses the strength and health he engenders by it. Capitalism makes less money in you by far when you make your own things than when you buy someone else's. Forget that not. The music geek condescends to everyone else's taste. He loves to yuck your yum. I have believed that on some level the music geek doesn't even like music, doesn't get it, and wants everyone else to join him in his sterile funk. When the revolution comes, he'll play Robespierre, and then look out for your head. Can music save your life? My former teacher, Jeffrey Hartman, said that most reading was vague and lazy, like girl watching. Feminists gave him the bastinado for it, but he was right in a way. Something similar is true about most music listening. Most music listening is about getting your emotions packaged for you, about quieting the static inside, about fabricating an exciting identity, the gangster, the hipster, to counteract one's commitment to a life of secure banality. Most music listening, like most reading, is about passivity too. It's about girl watching rather than woman wooing, which is a tougher game. Schopenhauer says that most reading is letting other people think your thoughts for you. I'd add that most music listening is about letting other people feel your feelings for you. Feel them for yourself, I say, then shout them out loud, and sing them too. It doesn't matter whether anyone's listening or not. Thanks. So there, all the music listeners, all the inveterate music listeners in the audience are probably really enraged at me. I'm sorry, but I'm not really sorry. Um, so tell me what your thoughts are, if you have any, or ask questions, or you know, provoke provocations, or anything you want to know. Let's say this is work in progress. It can be fixed, augmented, thrown out. Or it can be kept in its current pristine shape as per. <laughs> <laughs> I seriously doubt it's going to pay. How do you define music, and how do you define rock and roll, and how do you define the music that you listen to? Well, yeah, I was kind of fudging a little bit. I said rock and roll. Can rock and roll save your life? So I figured more people would show up. <laughs> 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 um, you know, rock and roll is the stuff that sounds like Chuck Berry and the Beatles. Um, how do you define music? That's really a tough one. That's really a tough one. I guess it's the stuff you put your headphones on to listen to, and your head goes like this. <laughs> you know, I mean, I can't do much better than that, frankly. I really can't. How much research did you do into Bob Dylan uh, before you wrote this poem? Because I imagine Bob Dylan was writing, you know, addressing his time, yeah. his situation, his world. You know, I, I think most people that probably write songs probably are writing from something that they've seen or yes. held or experienced. And so how much research did you do on Bob Dylan as you prepared, as you wrote this? Or, or, or I maybe have, nothing? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm now um, almost 60. Um, and um, the way I've taken to writing now is to find things that I've always been interested in but might be in, and might be interesting to others and just try to reflect on them based on my experience of them, somewhat with the hypothesis that they've been kind of sitting back there and something like my subconscious for a long time, getting worked over. And my wife is sitting here, and she will tell you periodically, I'll say, we'll be driving the car, and I'll think, and I'll say, you know, the thing about Dylan is, and, you know, this is sort of the air is full of electrons or, you know, something else. <laughs> And so there's that. So no research. <laughs> <This is answer. laughs> but research, you know, uh, many of the things that I read are full of research. Okay, but research is often just unmetabolized facts. You know, facts that haven't been lived with at all, that aren't part of the identity of the person who's writing. I mean, the whole idea of research, like you go out and find out about something that you don't know about because you weren't curious enough about it beforehand in order to write about it. Right? Or to think about it. You go out and read it up so as to write a scholarly article. You know, what? I don't want to read that. I want to read what's close to your heart or close to your mind and let that kind of unfold. Um, you know, the, the people that I'm jazzed about uh, um, 
reading, you know, my old teacher, Harold Bloom, he didn't sort of go out and do research on Shakespeare. He fell in love with Shakespeare, read a lot of Shakespeare, and then said, well, time to write a book about that. And then out it came. But the idea that he was doing research for it, per se, I don't think he did. But he, I mean, I read a lot of books on Dylan from time to time. I read a lot of articles on Dylan from time to time. And some stuff sticks and some doesn't. And I always have the assumption, it's kind of a romantic assumption, that that which sticks has a, has a, it, there's, there's a meaning for its sticking. You know, it means it has some significance, if only to me. So this may just this may just be like the somewhat glib voice of indolence, or it may be you know where writing can actually successfully come from. I'm not sure. Your tuning analogy really resonated with me. Yeah. And I'm wondering if uh, listening to music and maybe you know reading poetry, whatever, cons- consuming, as you said, to yeah. to um, tune your moods. Yeah. Do you think that creating is a way to have your moves kind of stay in tune then? I think that I wanted to just I'll just develop that because it's an important point and I don't know that I've, I've really got it nailed down at all but the idea was that um, sometimes you listen to music to tune your moods and as it were pacify yourself and you find a kind of hypnotic or almost mildly intoxicant order for your emotions, and it uh, makes life a little softer. How do you feel about, um, I guess, remixing was the only word I really have for it. I mean, you have yeah. bands like Led Zeppelin, who uh, arguably uh, got a lot of inspiration from uh, blues musicians, yeah. as well as other rock bands. Uh, Jimi Hendrix's cover of All Along the Watchtower, you have uh, cover music in general, or how about like the rampant sampling and electronic and hip-hop music these days, whether it be... Yeah purely inspiration that fuels your thing or using it as a stencil to kind of outline what you want to do and make it your own. Yeah, I mean, that's great. I love it when people do that. I love it when they do it. They, they continue the tradition or they shoot it in this direction or that. Um, the thing, obviously, that makes me really depressed is tribute bands. Right? Yeah. You know, you know it's, there's something kind of touching about them for a moment. And sometimes their names are really cool, right? Neil Diamond tribute band. Diamond in the Rough. <laughs> nice, you know? A lot of these things are good, but um, but that just seems to be really depressing. You know, like the Beatles tribute bands who fred around, and one guy's George, and one guy's <coughs> and one guy's Paul. That seems to take what you're describing a little too far. Thanks, Mark. My pleasure. Thank you, Survivors.